good I guess almost good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, two keys in our fight against cancer are the ability to detect cancer early and once detected, to wage the war by specifically targeting cancer cells while avoiding collateral casualties among our healthy cells. Our guest today, Dr. Mauro Ferrari, is bringing to bear the forces of many scientific and engineering disciplines to address both of these challenges. His multidisciplinary team and approach have resulted in exciting advances in the use of nano and microtechnology in both detection and treatment of cancer. These devices, which are measured in billionth or millionth of a meter, are capable of performing these amazing tasks because of their incredibly small size. Dr. Ferrari is an internationally recognized leader and a pioneer in biomedical microtechnology. His work is revolutionizing the ways in which we will be treating cancer in the next generation. Dr. Ferrari has degrees in mathematics and mechanical engineering and has served as professor at UC Berkeley, Ohio State, and UT Austin. While some might have their hands full with just one position, Dr. Ferrari currently has quite a few. He is serving as president and CEO of the Methodist Hospital Research Institute, executive vice president of the Methodist Hospital System, and director of the Methodist Institute for Academic Medicine. That's cool. Thank you. And Thank there's you. more. <laughs> you do more. He currently serves as senior associate dean and professor. He's also professor of medicine at Weill Cornell Medical College in New York, and he's the father of five children. Five. Come down. Five. Nice to meet you, by the way. My great pleasure. Uh, Dr. Ferrari is both an academic and an, entre and an entrepreneur. He not only directs the research into these fields of study, <laughs> but he's driving the adoption and application of this work into practical use. His work clearly illustrates the value and importance of using current research and technology to directly improve patient care. Several companies have originated from his laboratories, and he currently sits on the board of two companies. He has more than 30 US and international patents, over 250 publications, and has received numerous national and international awards. He is transforming medicine, bringing basic laboratory research to the patient's bedside. So please welcome Dr. Mauro Ferrari. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is great. Thank you so much. I'm so apologetic. Sorry about the delay. I never thought I was going to use the word uh, de-icing and Houston in the same sentence, <laughs> but I guess I did today. And I'm really, really sorry. Thank you so much for the invitation, Mr. President. It's wonderful to be here. And uh, I'm going to go in complete contravention of the recognized rules about public speaking. I speak too fast. I have an accent, there's nothing I can do about that. But I'll speak too fast, I'll show you too many slides, I will be, I will not, they will be too crowded, uh, what else? And I am probably leave all of, I'll talk about too many things, and I will probably leave all of you unhappy about the lack of depth in any specific subject that I touch in this quick presentation. And if there is a method to the madness or a reason why I'm doing that, is that I'm hoping that by covering a broad, broad, broad set of related topics, this will help us in the conversation that is coming up with the students or later on, right after this, when we are getting together, I believe, for a Q&A during lunch. So, uh, and also, I'm not going to follow the title. <laughs> Yeah, to some extent I am. Here we go. Let's see if this works. To some extent I am. Let's see if I can burn my hand here. Oops. Well, okay. So I'm going to talk about nanotechnology indeed. I was looking for la here it is, laser pointer. Terrific. Good. I'm good. Thank you much. Thank you. No, no, don't worry. I got them right here. It works. Thank you. So I will talk about nanotechnology and, it, and then the part has to do with societal horizons and implications. I will put in a little provocations here and there, and hopefully you'll be interested in picking them up. I hope I'm not going to fall off here. 
All right, so first, what is nanotechnology? You, had, you already heard the formal definition, things that have to do with nanometers. Nanometers are a billionth of a meter, so really, really small things. I'll show you a couple of nanometers later on. But it got this field of, doing, of playing Lego with things that are nanoscale as building blocks. It has become really important of late to the extent that the word got coined, the nanotechnology, and all sorts of institutions have programs in nanotechnology, and even Nature magazine started the new journal, Nature Nanotechnology, and they were kind enough to ask me, can you provide a definition? There are a number of different definitions out there, and as you know, we are all academics, and we pull definitions to our advantage. It's a bit of a Darwinian strategy for survival. So the definition that I'm going to propose to you is no better than anybody else's, but it tells you about my biases. So to me, nanotechnology has to do with things that are nanoscale in dimensions. No surprise there. Second, they have to be man-made. If it is something that you find, okay, it's something you find. It's not a technology. A techne is something that you make. Third, it has to have special properties because of its size. If it's just small, smaller than things you already have, and it does the same thing, okay, all right, it's small. It's not nanotechnology. And the fourth, and here is where it gets a bit controversial for me when I give this definition in the various academic venues, is, you know, it is hard to make things at the nanoscale, but not that hard anymore. That was the big frontier 20, 30 years ago. Now we have high school programs where we teach kids to make nano things. But measuring things at the nano, oh, there's more people up there. Measuring things at the nano scale is much harder than making things at the nano scale. And many times, see, these different properties, we call them emergent properties, that we want to measure, that are at the very foundation and definition of what nanotechnology is, are so hard to measure that most of the papers that I see, the emerging properties, are essentially experimental artifacts. So I said the way to defend yourselves against that is to have a, some sort of develop a predictive theory that will somehow prove to you that you should be expecting to see what you're telling me that you see. In short, it ain't nano if you don't have the math to back it up. Why math? Because I'm trained in math and then everything when you <laughs> What you have in your hand is a hammer, everything, everything looks like a nail. Any cogent proof, any other way that you want to do it, it's okay. I, I think I trained as a mathematician, so that's kind of where it starts for me. So how, how nano is nano? Well, I'm going to be using this, this slide to tell you a couple of provocative thoughts. Not only to tell you how small is nano, you know, you know small. <laughs> The distance between an atom and its second closest neighbor, say, in a crystalline lattice, that's a nanometer. So, you know, two, three atoms at a time, it's a nanometer, small. But uh, why am I showing you this? Well, because uh, I want to make a couple of points. The first is that uh, biology is built out of nano pieces. Nucleic acids, DNA, a couple of nanometers across. Proteins, maybe 10, 15, 20 nanometers across. And then you build up from that. If you are able to build things up like nature does, I'm a big believer in trying to imitate nature as much as possible. If you are able to put nano pieces together, you can get a further round of emerging properties when you hit the micro scale. Look at what biology does. By assembling a ton of different nano pieces in an intelligent fashion, in a functional fa fashion, the emerging property that nature gets is life. Talk about emergence. Nothing smaller than the micron range has got life. Micron range, you break through a wall, and all of a sudden you get a truly unbelievable degree of complexity and beauty and all that good stuff. I'm not going to be advocating, I never will advocate that we make life. I don't think it is possible. Even if it is possible, it's not a good idea. I don't think. But the notion of integrating nanos into micro opens 
believable horizons. And that is what is going to be some of the examples that I tell you. The other story that I want to tell you from this slide is that this is the first nano drug. Here we're starting to talk about nanomedicine. The first nano drug that entered the clinic that was before the word nano was used. But any definition that you take for nano will incorporate that drug. So nano drugs have been in the clinic already for about 20 years, and they are right, rather commonly used. So here it is. I told you about the beginning of the word nano. Well, as you know, the word nano, it's, uh, it's uh, the prefix nano is a Greek prefix that means apt to bring in dollars from Washington, D.C. <laughs> So today, just about everything is nano because it helps with your grades. But if you look at the history, there are other definitions, but they are not good for mixed audiences. <laughs> if you look uh, at the first use of the word nano, comes from this guy's paper about 40 years ago already. A number of people have been pointed to as, as, as father founders, if you will, of the discipline. I'll tell you my favorites in a moment. But for instance, remember Fantastic Voyage? Those of you that are about my age, great movie. There is no nano in the, the word nano is never used in that, nor in any of Isaac Asimov's books. Even though the notion of shrinking, going smaller, using that to cure disease, is of course very akin to what nano actually does these days. My Feynman, great physicist Nobel laureate, gave a famous address at Caltech in 1959 at the American Physical Society where he said, there is plenty room at the bottom. We are going to be able to pick up smaller and smaller things as building blocks. That was the gist. He didn't use the word nano, but this is probably a great father founder of nanotechnology. To me, this is the big story, though. Think of how the world has changed in the last few decades. Clearly, microelectronics, communications have changed everything, right? Think of the fact that, that how did that happen with microchips, right? Microchips, electronics, computers, all that good stuff. Now you got Facebook, you got all sorts of great things. Now, each of you in your pockets have more computing power than NASA did when they landed people on the moon by a factor of about 100. How is that possible? Because the great people that knew how to make microchips back in the days, the people won Nobel Prizes from Texas on that, you remember? You know, Kirby, no, all right. From that point, they learned to make chips smaller and smaller, components smaller and smaller. What's smaller than micron? That's where nano comes in. And if you can make the same component just a lot smaller, given that electrons travel pretty much at this constant speed, you can get those electrons to get places faster, communication is faster, computing power goes up, it's an inverse proportion. The smaller it is, the better it works by and large. So now, electronics, back in my days, nanoelectronics didn't even exist. Ten years ago, it was a bit of a dream at the horizon. Now, everything you have that you would ever want to use that's got electronics in it is nano. Nano has completely taken over the electronics industry. Everything is nano. The only things that are non-nano are in museums. And everything you're wearing on yourself and bringing around is nanoelectronics. So very pervasive. Here is my statement. I think you're going to see the same, if not more, happen in medicine, changing everything. For the reasons that have to do with the way biology is built that I mentioned earlier. So, I told you about liposomes, the first nano drugs. There is a bunch of other things that were part of science before the nano days. Sometimes I go and give talks and people get upset. Oh, you didn't mention my field and that field and the other field. It was even before you nano guys. Yes, but you know, the way science works is that once there is enough body of investigations and discoveries in an area, that's when you come up with a name, right? Not to diminish what people have done before. It's a way to glorify what people have done before. I hope nobody gets offended. We don't just come up with labels and then we try to find a way to fill the bucket. So it's a natural, it's a natural story. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of my heroes of nanotechnology. Uh, well, these guys were the first, uh, they were actually at IBM, to 
pick up atoms. Each of these dots you see right here is an atom and move them around in the process of discovering a certain technology called atomic force microscopy, a relay, scanning tunnel microscopy is a set of different things. So each dot here is an atom. It's a little thing that you can use it's for some other uh, talk. Then Houston, Texas, da -da -da, Houston, Texas comes up and these three guys discover the soccer ball, the smallest possible soccer ball, carbon-60. At each of the vertices of this soccer ball, you have a carbon atom. It was a molecule that wasn't supposed to exist. There were actual crystallographic arguments why it should not possible, be possible for this thing to exist and it's cast the nanotubes. But this fella said, okay, fine, we saw it, now let's explain it. So this is Dr. Smalley, Dr. Curl, and Dr. Croto, Sir Croto. And uh, so this is the Fullerings, three-dimensional nano-assemblies of carbon atoms. Nobel Prize, this is physics, this is chemistry. Three years ago, these guys get the Nobel Prize for two-dimensional assemblies of carbon atoms, so-called graphene, in physics. Now, wait a second. Nobel Prize in chemistry, if it is three-dimensional assembly of carbon atoms, you go to two dimensions, Nobel Prize in physics, how does this make any sense? That's the beauty of it. It doesn't. <laughs> That's the beauty of it. When you get to the nano world, all of these artificial distinctions between the sciences that we've come up with, they fall apart. And that's a good thing. It means the science is evolving. Those definitions were good for a certain phase of evolution of science and knowledge. Now we're all grown up. Let's throw them away. Let's focus on solving problems and forget about these taxonomies that are very artificial. That is a little bit of a provocation. There is even worse stuff coming up. <laughs> now here is the first nano drug. A liposome, inside of that, there is a drug that we've been using for many years. It's called adriamycin or doxorubicin. It's a drug that messes up with cells as they are in the process of dividing. And given the cancer cells divide a lot, they tend to kill those preferentially, but not only. They will pretty much kill any cell that is in the process of dividing. One problem with adriamycin, great drug, we use it all the time, is that for those of you that, that, that work in the field, it's also affectionately nicknamed uh, the Red Death because it makes people very, very sick. And uh, in particular, it is very toxic to the heart. And there is only so much doxorubicin that you can take. Even if it works against your cancer, there comes a point, a tabulated point, where I'm sorry, ma'am, I cannot give you any more doxorubicin. I know it is keeping your cancer in check. I know we don't have another drug that we can use. I know that your cancer is going to explode, now it's going to kill you, but if I give you more doxorubicin, you're going to die faster, and I cannot justify that. Can you imagine this conversation? Well, that's the conversation that we have every day in cancer worlds throughout the country, throughout the world, not only for doxorubicin, for pretty much any other drug. It's very sad, very, very painful. So somebody figured out that if you put doxorubicin inside of a little fat globule of nanoscopic dimensions, about 100 nanometers, and you inject this thing in the bloodstream, aha, you don't get as much drug in the heart, and you get more drug in the cancer. Wow, terrific. So I can give more drug, it gets to the right place, less cardiac toxicity, can survive perhaps metastatic disease for a bunch longer. That's a good thing. But there is one trick that I haven't told you about yet. The hair on this little particle is something called polyethylene glycol, which is very similar to what they use to the ice my plane this morning, pretty much the same thing. Very <laughs> unfortunately, but true. So, so this fella right here, why do we need that? Well, because you know the body is built with all sorts of defenses of protections, that's why we are alive. And one of those protections uh, is a system that we call the reticular endothelial system that is essentially whose job is to protect against a number of different things, including particles that are traveling around the bloodstream. They are not supposed to be there. So we have trapping organs that essentially purify the bloodstream of unexpected presence. And a great member of that system is the liver and the spleen and other things as well. But if you don't put peg around this particle, the liver 
sees it fly by and say, ha, ah, you're mine. I will sequester you and I'll try to destroy you or to excrete you. So this little polyethylene glycol covering allows your particle to stay in circulation longer so that it can get to the tumor and concentrate there. This is another great example of a serendipitous discovery. He was a graduate student at California, San Francisco, a good friend of mine. One day he made a mistake. <laughs> I said, what am I going to do? I got these mice here. I put this peg I wasn't supposed to. What am I going to do? Oh, OK, let's inject. And then he worked a bit better and he said, hey, hey, professor, look what I found. I'm not recommending that we do that, especially in, 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 with respect for animal welfare. So why do these guys concentrate in the tumor? There is no recognition capability here whatsoever. But if you look at the details of so how the blood vessels work that feed tumors, especially during their high growth phase called angiogenesis, in the angiogenic or angiogenetic phase of cancer growth, the blood vessel walls are disorganized. They are building too fast. You get these defects. These that we call fenestrations. In medicine, we like to use big words for simple things. <laughs> holes. But if you cannot tell people, you got holes. You got fenestration. Sounds very scientific. <laughs> well, we got fenestrations in healthy parts of the body, too. But through these fenestrations, if you make your particle the right size, it's going to go through. Whereas a healthy blood vessel, a blood vessel that feeds a healthy part of the body, does not have those fenestrations, only in certain parts of the body and not as much. So make it small enough, we'll get to the right place preferentially. Based on that principle, keep in mind, so it is one of the internal barriers of the body that gets modified during cancer. So you can take advantage of the modification of the small internal barrier of the body to deliver preferentially. I'll come back to this philosophy in a moment. But based on this notion, there is about a dozen different drugs that are families of drugs that are nanotype in the, in, the, in the world that have been approved and that are used every day. Some of these are billion dollar drugs, blockbuster drugs. And the over, if you look at the overall market, it's a bad word, but it's a good, it's a good, uh, it correlates very well with patient use. So we like, to, with no disrespect, we like to use the word market. It's a surrogate for a, a level of usage. So the market, between 5 and 10% of all cancer drugs are nanodrugs. Less than 5 to 10% of cancer doctors know that. So the acid, you get cancer doctors come and ask me, so where are we going to see the first nanodrug? You've been using it for 20 years. That's the typical conversation. But again, no disrespect. A moment that I think was pretty significant in the development of nanomedicine was when, of course, the leading country in the world, the United States, decided to put together a program at the National Cancer Institute to be then used as a conduit for funding laboratories across the nation, a program in cancer nanotechnology. So I got called up. They called me up, brought me in, and said, would you work with us a couple of years to put this together? I said, sure. Delighted to do this, so I put it together in 2005, we issued it. And to give you an idea of how serious they were, this was the committee that they put together to help me. I clearly needed all the help that I could get. And pretty much everybody in this picture has got a Nobel Prize. This guy here is James Watson. This is Lee Hartwell. This is Eric Lander, and so on and so forth. So you can imagine, I was pretty terrified. When I went to Mr. Watson, Dr. Watson said, let me tell you, I think you know, you've been going wrong about curing cancer so far. Let me tell you how we're going to do this with this nano stuff. And by the way, I got my tenure in civil engineering and my degrees, <laughs> and my degrees are in mathematics. So that was, that, was, that was an interesting, fascinating situation. And then surprises started happening, such as Nature asked me to write Nature Reviews Cancer. This got a higher impact factor than Sports Illustrated, or other journals that we don't mention. You know, this is, they said, we want to know. OK, fine. So I wrote this thing. And essentially, I wrote it in 2005. Eight years later, I find that the progress that has been made, I thought I was letting it fly very wildly back then. Progress has been made is much, much greater than what I anticipated. But the basic notions remain the same. What can nanotechnology do for you? 
get your medicine to the right place. Make sure it is delivered in the right time release profile. Making sure that we figure out if it is working or not. This sounds like you know, very simple ideas. None of this happens in medicine, unfortunately. And maybe you can convince the body to heal itself, kind of help it, give it some tools. And do this for everybody at any moment in the course of their disease in a different way, because I'll tell you, there is one thing that I've learned, is that uh, cancer, no, we used to say cancer, one disease, one cause, one cure. 25 years later, I don't think I've seen two cancers that were the same, never. I don't think I've seen one cancer stay the same in any patient that I followed. Never. It is like malignant snowflakes. So this whole idea of individualizing care is not only a good idea, it's a necessity. Unless we do that, we are not going to be able to progress much against cancer. So that is the story. I'm going to give you four examples. Remember those four things that I said, right place, right time, and whatever. I'll give you four examples. This come out of my lab, but you know, to, because those are the things that I know the best. Not that they are any better than anybody else's, but you know, that's what I would, if you ask me to talk, so you get my stories. Okay, so the first is getting things to the right place. How do you do that? I have something that we call multi-stage vectors, or MSVs. And let me tell you about that a little bit. So I told you that the big problem is not so much recognizing cancer as it is making it across the barriers that protect the cancer. Take advantage, remember the blood vessel walls, how they modify? Well, there is many other barriers that divide the body into compartments. And you need to have magic keys to get from one room to the next. Making it across biological barriers. So my basic philosophy is, let's understand how those barriers get modified in the course of cancer progression and take advantage of those modifications. You've seen the one case, there's many other cases. This is an article that we wrote on that in Nature. I'm just going to show you Nature publications. And uh, um, even though Nature wasn't kind to me last week, I don't know if you saw that, but it's all right. It's fine. Okay. And so how do you get to the right place? To get across all of these barriers, they come at you one after the other. You know, how do you do that? Remember, we're living in Houston, Texas. Remember, Houston, I have a problem. Remember Apollo 13. How did they get to the moon? They had the rocket, they had three stages, right? Single cannonball didn't do. And that's an easy trip. To get to a cancer inside of the body is a much harder trip. A nano cannonball is not going to do. A nano drug is not going to do. A mo drug molecule of the normal type is not going to do. Transport, recognition, and cancer killing or modulation are three different functions. You need to take care of all three. Single molecule doesn't do. I think we need more greater complexity than that. So we came up with this crazy idea. First stage is going to land on the blood vessel wall. It's going to release second stages. They are going to penetrate deep into the tissue. Third stage is going to get inside of the cell and take care of business. Aha. And people say, what? Obviously, <laughs> and rightfully so. Then we got another cover of nature when we started showing that actually you could do something like that. And these we made out of what? Remember how the world got changed through electronics? What was the magic material that we used for electronics? Silicon, right? You can make it in large quantities, very cheap. You can control manufacturing in an unbelievable way. You can scale it up. You can do quality control in every step of the production processes. Said, so I'm going to use silicon. But I want to make silicon biodegradable because I don't want anything to remain in the body after the treatment. So I'm going to porosify it. So we developed we got about 20 patents on this. A bunch of different ways we make it sponge like so that it can pick up the second stages and the third stages. And because it is sponge like, it degrades in the body and leaves nothing harmful behind. What you already have in terms of baseline on orthosilicic acid is much more than I'm going to be giving anybody on any treatment of this type. So it's a good starting point. At least you're asking me, I tell you it's a good starting point. And then we get another little nature story beyond drug delivery. Let me come back to the notion of life at the micro scale as a combination of pieces of the nano scale, right? Look at what the cell does. A cell is a smart assembly of nanomachines. 
So what I will be trying to do here is a very simple replica of the most elementary of functions. Very, very, very elementary. It's not going to get much more complex, not in my lab, but that's what it is. It's a micron-sized particle with nanoscale components. I'm going to show you a little few examples of what you can do with this. Some of my favorites. But first I'm going to show you a little movie. That, okay, what you're going to see here, you're going to look inside of an animal that has a human cancer. Human cancer got transplanted. And look at what you see right here. These are the blood vessels that I was telling you that feed the cancer. This is the arterial side, and then there's a bit of a capillary exchange, and then you're going to see the venous side on the other side. This is called intravicular microscopy. We picked up and developed these tools that were originally developed by Rakesh Jain at Harvard and Mass Jain, Mass Jain. We picked it up to look at particles, because I have all this theory about crossing biological barriers. I have to prove it to people, I have to show it. And then, as we started working with that, so, of course, we developed tools to do that. And what you're going to see right here, also in the same system, everything you see that is red is one of those nanoparticles. That is, uh, and the blue, we color code in blue here, the red blood cells as they go through the bloodstream. That was something that we picked up to study particles. And then we had surprise, which we clearly we can do. But then we had surprises. One surprise that we had, okay, I'm sorry, I'm changing the order a little bit, I'm going to come back to this, is this. This is the human breast cancer, triple negative, inside of a mouse. We inject a drug, or a drug equivalent, if you will, a drug model. Look at the drug right here. What is the important part of the story? This. There's nothing here, right? I can go out 10 times, it would be a very boring slide, but I can go out 10 times and it's all black. And here is where I get very unpopular with pharmaceutical companies. When I come to this point and I say, I don't care about new drugs. You guys are spending billions and billions of dollars and charging everybody billions and billions of dollars for new drugs that are molecularly targeted. That's a great idea and there is a use for that. But let's keep things in perspective. Nothing gets in. All right? Nothing gets in. We, I can talk about this. I've done so much studies on this. Unbelievable. Any drug you want. I get a single primary cancer, multiple metastases to the liver, same generation. A drug gets into two and not into the other seven. You're going to die from the other seven. One day you define me hanging from a bridge. <laughs> This may be the reason. There may be other reasons, but this may be a reason. <laughs> All right? So it's a problem of transport. It's a problem of barriers. This darn thing, cancer, hijacks our body's defensive system. That's what gives it an evolutionary advantage. That's why it can stay there no matter what you throw at it. It has been able to protect itself. It has created a little castle of protection around itself. But coming back to the previous picture, remember I want to land on the blood vessel wall. How do I do that? Not easy. I want to land the particle on the blood vessel wall, and then I'm reminded that in the days of the Wright brothers, they build a little thing and they try to see if it will fly. It didn't work. They changed a few things and they see if it will fly, and so on and so forth. These days, we don't design planes that way. Well, the one that I flew in this morning with probably did. But, but not, not frequently, at least. It was one of these Embraer little things. I was thinking, oh, Lord. We do a lot of math. This is where the math comes in. So we started saying, I'm going to be designing my particles so that in the blood vessels that feed the tumor, they take advantage of the dynamics of blood flow there so that they will marginate efficiently and get to the blood vessel wall in greater concentration. It's margination. They have to stick there, firm adhesion. Then they have to be internalized by the cells and transported deep into the tumor. I said, fine, I'm just going to get the mathematical equations. We know a little bit of math, and we use those for essentially coming up with design rules for particles. So that was a great idea. Then we went and looked at the books. Couldn't find a single equation. <laughs> 
the dead margination, adhesion, transport, there wasn't any. So we started developing some math, took a bit of time. But I'll ask you a question. So the objective of this, I want to design the particles so that it will concentrate as best as possible on the blood vessel wall. Now the question for you is this. Let's just think about shape. Of all, everything else being equal, characteristics of flow, biology, payload, uh, materials, whatever. What is, I cannot ask you what is the best shape, there is no answer to that. I mean, it depends, individualized medicine, that's a good thing. But I can ask you what is the absolute worst possible shape that a particle can have uh, if I wanted to marginate and stick. What is the absolute worst possible shape? Somebody help me. Sphere. It took you the whole of three seconds. It took me 10 years and about $10 million <laughs> of your taxpayers' money to prove it, and still they don't believe me. Perhaps because the vast majority of nanotechnology is nano little particles. So the second reason why you may find me hanging one day is exactly this. Shape matters, matters a lot. So, I am Italian by origin, I am an incurable romantic, it's in my DNA, so I think of the fight against cancer in romantic terms. You have the damsel in distress locked up someplace inside of the castle, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, of course a metaphor for life, if you will. The good news is, and the, and the princess is locked up in this room where this monster that wants to kill her, right? That would be the metaphor for cancer. The good news is, it's very easy to kill the monster. I don't need no drugs. I can kill cancer with water. You can kill cancer with a drop of water. Try it in the lab. Very easy, right? Problem is, getting whatever you do to the right place is a problem of transport. So in the analogy here, the damsel in distress is in here someplace with a, with, a, with a monster that is very easy to kill, but I don't know which room she's in. There's about 10,000 rooms. To get there, you have to go. There is a moat, there is high walls, there is the archers on, 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 on the walls, and there is the crocodiles in the moat, all sorts of other things. And I don't have the magic keys. So that's where the problem is, the problem of transport. So we call this transport oncophysics. To me, cancer is a disease of mass transport dysregulation. That's my definition of cancer. So back in the days, we came up with this crazy idea of using nano against cancer, which some people had already done without knowing that it was nano. So then, like the way we like to operate, I'm going to speak about interdisciplinarity. I think it's very appropriate for this group. I put together a bunch of different interdisciplinary groups. I got myself national centers, one from DOD, one from the uh, National Cancer Institute. Started discovering from the images that we were using to understand how particles are transported that all drugs, nano or non-nano, face the same problems. Started thinking about transport of oncophysics, as I told you. People started laughing again, and then look, Six years later, we get the cover of Nature Reviews Cancer once again. Now for Cancer Oncophysics. Invited by the, the, the eminent uh, editors, they call me up and say, write one up like you did six years ago. I said, sure. But we're going to send it for review. I said, sure, go ahead and do that. That's the way you do it. So I write it, we send it in, we with we, these great colleagues. They send it out to review, and one of those reviewers was so upset at us. I said, come on, guys. What does physics have to do with cancer? And I said, guys, they said, I don't know that we can, I talked to my co-authors, I said, I don't know that we can address this criticism, but we can change the title. <laughs> so either we published or we annoyed the heck out of him, and either, either outcome is going to be pleasant. Uh -huh. So that's what we did. We changed the title, we added a paragraph that said, look at the history of biology. You saw Watson, I never met Dr. Crick. Watson was a biologist. Crick was a physicist. For those of you that study immunology, Delbrook was a physicist. I can keep on going on and on. Let's break down those barriers. Let's bring everybody together. Forget about those disciplinary taxonomies and look at solving problems for people. 
So we got another center now, a national center for transport oncophysics. Each of these, just to do a little bit of numbers, I'm going to get to crass dollars shortly. Each of these is about $15 million. So those three centers bring home close to $50 million of research money. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, interdisciplinarity. These I like to show very much. This is just publications from my lab. They got just the covers, not the, all the other ones that didn't get the cover. These are just the cover. Why do I show this to you? Well, it makes me feel good, for one thing. And the other reason is that, look, look at the, at the, the diversity of topics. It's physical chemistry, it's, it's molecular oncology, it's material science, it's, all sorts of different things. You cannot make real <laughs> progress unless you work breaking down those boundaries and those barriers. Now I'm going to show you a few stories, just pictorial. Then you can. There's a so in my lab, I have about 120 people from many, many different backgrounds, but mostly, most of them are cell biologists, many of them the largest group. So they study how particles get picked up and brought inside of the cell. It's a bit of a like. It's, 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 it's an epical struggle, and it's, it's dramatic. You can even go inside of the cells and target subcellular domains. But now I want to tell you a little bit about a few variations on this theme and the type of things that you can do. So this is, is a delivery strategy for ovarian cancer that is metastatic. In, ca in animal models, we've been able to show great efficacy in, in, in recent uh, studies essentially obliterating the metastatic tumor burden and that, that, that with a combination of a certain siRNA and a certain chemotherapeutic agent. The second stage particle here, the first stage is, 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 is of course, is the silicon particle. Second stage is a nanoliposome. This is perhaps my favorite animal experiment ever that we did in our lab. This, I'm going to show it to you in three different animal models. Triple negative breast cancer. Those are the breast cancers for which we don't have molecular targeted therapeutics. They tend to be aggressive, worse prognosis, you know, the whole bit. So triple negative breast cancer, metastasis to the lungs. In the clinic, when that happens, it takes a miracle. All right. All right, so this is a particle designed mathematically so that it will concentrate in blood vessel walls that feed the area of the lungs where the metastases are. It starts with math. Then you get the people that do the silicon and make the particles. Then we load it up with a certain conventional drug inside of a polymeric nanoparticle. This tells you what percent of the animals you see. This is going down with time. The more color you see, the more red you see, the more cancer you get. So if you do nothing, they all die very quickly. If you do anything else we get in the book, they all die very quickly, a little bit slower. If you do P-dox, doxorubicin, with, with the polymeric particle and the silicon, half of them, now they are now collecting social security checks. I'm thinking of moving them to Florida or something. This is long-term survival, no residual disease. These animals live as long as they're healthy brethren. Uh, if you look at the median survival, you know, FDA approves cancer drugs with a, with a median survival benefit of two weeks. This would be the equivalent to 10, 15 years. Hey, can I get this to the clinic? I don't know. To, to cure mice is much easier. <laughs> and now we are doing everything we can to move forward. Different model for those of you that work in these areas, you need to have different models. So we got different models. I would highly recommend it is still embargoed. But I would highly recommend that, that you look at Nature magazine. You may find something from us that has to do with triple negative breast cancer, but it is still embargoed, so I'm not going to tell you about it. And uh, the, this, the approval for that came in on Friday. So Abraxane, no liver metastasis, again designed to concentrate in the liver. You can do better uh, contrast agents, about 100 times more powerful, to do MRI with a system that's got nanotubes. And that's another na different nature nanotech story. You can do gold nanoparticles and do thermal ablation, so essentially cook locally the tumor. And this is another story that came in in nature nanotech. Uh, uh, these are all different non nature papers. Uh, the, the, this terrific guy, he works with me, he's a young man, Ennio Tashotti. I call him the Alain Delon, for those that remember the Alain Delon on nanomedicine. 
So anion, you know, the liver is there and picks up the drugs and the nanoparticles. And with the multi-stage vectors, it gets better. It doesn't get picked up as much. But there's still room to improve, right? So Ennio comes up with the idea and says, if you were to be parachuted behind enemy lines, if you got to do that, the smart thing is to wear the uniform of the enemy, right? So good idea. So what are the cells that pick up in the liver the nanoparticles they go through? Well, those would be certain phagocytic cells that, you know, they replace the endothelial cells in the sinusoids of the liver. So how about Kupfer cells, the macrophage type of cells? So why don't we take their cell membrane, strip them from the cells, and put them on the particles? So that was this idea. So remember this idea of mimicking nature? The particles that, 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 that get to the blood vessel walls, uh, they look flat like discs. Hey, took us a few years to design them, and then we realized, hey, we invented platelets. <laughs> <laughs> so we call them platelets. But this one, we said we're going to call them leukolike because they are like leukocytes from the very beginning, so that we avoid embarrassment. So this I already told you, but then we're going to do that. I'm going to tell you quickly three other stories. One, I told you right place. Now I'm going to tell you right time. I want to develop systems that are in the body, they release drugs with the right time release uh, in the number of different ways. I'm going to pick up the speed here. That can be done. The magic component for doing that is nanochannels. You see nanoparticles. I'm going to show you three other nano things. Nanochannels. Channels that are a few nanometers, in this case is 3.6 nanometer across, because the dynamics of transport across nanochannels of molecules is non-traditional, doesn't follow fixed rules, for those of you that study physical chemistry. That is non-fiction, and we can predict it. That's why I started with the definition. You can build from basic principles, you can build the, 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 the non-fiction transport in a predictive fashion, so if you were wondering how big a nanometer is, each of these dots here is, a, is, is an atom, is a silicon atom. So I can measure exactly how big this got. These nanochannels, the drug is in here, moves out this way, dynamics of transport are different. These we have developed to industrial scale. We have created a company. The company is going out, it's an agreement with pharmaceutical companies. We have six implants with drugs that are moving towards clinical application with major pharmaceutical companies. The company is located in Austin, Texas. So happy to help bring some employment opportunities here. One of the products is long-term prevention of recurrence of breast cancer with this drug called Litrozole that is currently taken orally. And this way, it's got a number of advantages, such as reducing damage to the bone, induced fragility of the bone. Another story, a young man here, he, um, Tony, Tony Yu, was my student at University of Texas Austin, now he's with me, he's an assistant professor, he's a genius. He came up with this notion of texturing, doing nanotextures on surfaces, and using that to selectively pick up, not girls, to selectively pick up molecules from very complex biological systems like the, like the body. You remember that this wonderful young lady was faced about a year ago with a major problem. She carries the BRCA1 mutation, okay, and uh, pretty much all of the ladies in her family, her mother, her aunt, and her sister, had died or had severe breast cancer. BRCA1 cancer mutation induces triple negative breast cancer, the same type for which I said we don't have a fee, uh, the targeted therapeutics. So she said, I know I'm going to get it, probably, because the numbers, the numbers are scary. So what am I going to do? She said, double preventive, double radical mastectomy. It's a tough choice. Your daughters have that, you're looking at them, they are 10, 12, 14, 16. Hey, so wouldn't it be great if you could detect in people, if they have an active process, of oncogenesis, uh, 
Not the risk factor. The risk factor, come on, that's the gene part, it's easy. Let's do the real thing. What's actually happening? That's the protein side of life. Can we figure that out? Well, 20,000 genes, maybe 2 million different uh, proteins and protein byproducts in the bloodstream, 10 orders of magnitude of concentration differences, astronomical numbers, how do you do that? It's a technological problem. So that's what we set up to do, and that's what Tony does with the system that I'll show you in a moment. Look at this, BRCA positive, non-cancer cancer, pretty good signature. He's got the same for, he's now, once you have the technology, you apply it across multiple things. He's got the same just published in all sorts of covers of journals for tuberculosis in the presence of HIV infection. He's got the same for iron deficiency, even psychiatric disorder, major depression with, with psychotic features. So once you come up with this big difference making technology, the applications in medicine are just a matter of persistence and then you figure them out. This also was a nature story. And uh, this is the technology. These are the nanosurfaces. You use them to separate out the molecules that you want, and then you don't read individual molecules, individual signatures, individual biomarkers. I don't believe in those. You read combinations. You read profiles. Biology is not as simple as we would like for it to be. Last story has to do with uh, Okay, not too long ago, Department of Defense issued a call, a national call, for people to come up with a solution of this problem. Now, we can save life many times in war theaters, but limb is a different story. You step on an improvised explosive device, you get the type of damage to the limbs that we cannot fix, so we have to amputate. Same type of uh, devastating injuries that you can get on highways, that you can get on work sites. So it is not a military problem. It's an everybody's problem. So they said, we want to get a different thing. This was uh, something that was put out by DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, that is, they are the people that look at the frontiers of the frontiers. So and we said, fine, they want crazy people. I think we can do this. But what exactly, what do you want? And they said, we don't want to do surgery. We want to inject the material. And then we want the material to solidify inside where the bone used to be. <laughs> and then we want this to solidify quick enough that the guy can get up and walk within a couple of hours behind the rocks. Said, Come on, I cannot do that. How about two weeks? OK, two weeks. Said, Fine, two weeks. And then it got difficult. And then they said, and this thing has to disintegrate I said, come on, man, you just let the guy just start walking, now you want to disintegrate, doesn't make any sense. Yes, but it is to stimulate the regrowth of bone, like lizards, when they lose their tail, then they can grow back. Well, do that with people. We ask them, excuse us, two questions. One, are you crazy? <laughs> and the second, how much money have you got? <laughs> Okay, so we said, let's imitate the repair processes of the body. I don't want to get technical. So we put together a combination of different components with a lot of nanoparticles that release different things, growth factors and what have you, and then put it together with all with bioresorbable materials, and then you got to try it. And then you try it. You don't try it on people, obviously. You try on the large animal models that the Pentagon wants, sheep and goats. And these guys don't behave. You can tell your patients, sit in bed for three weeks. These guys, they don't want to hear about that. <laughs> so it turned out that it wasn't as easy as we thought. But I'll show you patient zero. Patient zero, a couple of weeks later, you see the bone is regrowing. The fracture there was really big, would have never grown back together by itself. You can see it with the CT even better. And I'm going to show you the movie. This is three weeks after surgery. This sheep doesn't even know that she got hurt. We measure, gait, quantitatively, whatever else. This is as stupid as sheep are going to be. It jumps up and down and does all sorts of different things. Doesn't even know. Now, it's going to take a little bit of time to take it to people. I think we're going to do osteoporosis first, and not the shattering fractures. But good things can happen. 
I know that I'm probably late. Can I get five more minutes to show you societal implications? Will you allow five more minutes? Thank you. I'm going to start with societal implications. You know, as much as we can do, you guys have to do more. I'm talking especially to the students. And those folks that are even younger than you are are going to have to take care of me when I get older. And I'm well on my way. So we have a lot of programs where we teach children, small children, this is in a small town, about 400 people, used to be 4,000, in the poorest part of Europe. Happens to be a part of Italy that is not far to where I come from. And so we have the World Meeting Invitational with Nobel laureates and things every summer. And these kids know more Nobel laureates than any number of people that I know. We give out little scientist cards to the kids and they come and they listen to the, and you got all the grandmas and we talk about the science and whatever else. This has saved a town that was dying. They were closing down the schools. Now they got the restaurant and they got the little things and the kids are learning a bunch of stuff. The town is called Gagliato. Recently his name changed and is the Paese delle Nanoscienze. It's the town of nanosciences officially and we're very proud of that. I'm going to show you some naked people now. <laughs> so I showed you the interface with education. Then you didn't ask me, how do you make small nano channels? I'll tell you how we make them. First, we burn a hole on a substrate with something that is like light. It's photolithography. That's how you make silicon, right? Then, courtesy of the goddess of the waters, we put a sacrificial layer right here, a layer of pearls, if you will. And then you put inside the filler material. What I'm going to do next, courtesy of the goddess of wine and the centaur, we are going to be dissolving the pearls. It is a mythological thing. It's probably not true, but it's part of some literature. That you can dissolve pearls with wine, so it creates an opening. So now, if you can control the thickness of the, of the pearls layer, you have an exactly tuned nano channel exactly as many atoms as you want. I can make them as small as two nanometer, six atoms count them. OK, so why am I showing these naked people to you? Interface between nano and art. This is the part where I talk about societal interfaces. Nano and art. This is the guy that made the painting. He's a pretty famous uh, painter, close friend of mine right now, Maestro Bruno D'Arcevia. This is, a paint, this is another painting of his that shows you the size. These have been exhibited all over the world, New York and San Francisco most recently, at uh, different important galleries. This is a, 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 a mythological representation of multi-stage. There's many other elements. This is the hydrolemna, it's cancer. But you know, so there is a lot that you can do, uh, many other science and art projects that we follow. Mathematics. Uh, of course, I had in mind your distinguished president here, Dr. Berger. Mathematics, I told you, it all starts with mathematics. I gave you one example, I could have given you many more. This is a recent uh, thing about uh, the connection of nanomedicine and mechanics, and the connector between the three is mathematics. There is a ton of math in the medicine of the future. We bring things to the patients, right? That is the ultimate objective. I got news. You cannot do that from a university lab. You need to partner up or to create a private sector interface that's got pharmaceutical grade capabilities. And that is what we do. So we started several companies. I told you about a couple. These are the guys that do the nano channels here in Austin, Texas. Keep in mind, I have a financial interest in them. Not enough, unfortunately, but you know, that's the way life is. But I'm disclosing it to you. These are the guys that do the multi-stage. This, this company, at the beginning of the year, we do nanoparticles in that company. At the beginning of the, about eight months ago, they traded on NASDAQ. I'm not, I'm not telling you to buy. I'm telling you not to buy. But I want to tell you the story. It was worth, the overall market cap was $20 million, which means you're so nano that you're going to die. Now it's worth about $600 million. And the reason for that is that one of these nanoparticles with a certain agent loaded in that was shown in clinical trials to do well on hepatitis B, which is a disease for which we don't have a cure. Not, not bad. So thousands of jobs, you know, there's many different implications that come with that. And I haven't told you about Methodist, but at Methodist, of course, we are 
number one hospital in Texas for the last 15 years. We are you know, big, and uh, pretty good, a bunch of different things come and visit. But one thing that we do, since I became president of the Research Institute, I said, I want to facilitate the translation of great idea into the clinic. I'm going to create all the interfaces, the type of core infrastructure that pharmaceutical companies need. And we're going to put it all in our new building that I opened three years ago. And it is uh, this building. It's got all of the different things. These are the people that I've recruited so far. It's been a great ride. We have about 1,000 employees. If you guys want to come in and work with us, we will be delighted. We are very collaborative. And we got what it takes to go all the way from discovery all the way to, to, tech, to, to clinical. I run 800 clinical trials right now. And this is the building. So when you come and visit, come up this way, go all the way down to the end to the left, close to the bathroom because I'm getting older. OK. <laughs> Nano and ethics. The most important thing about Methodist is our ethical values, our eye care values. It's integrity, compassion, accountability, respect, and excellence. Everything we do is based on that. Ethics is really important. Every time, it's, it's who we are. It's the driving force. It's not the boundary condition. It's the driving force. Everything we do is based on that. And I've been spending a bunch of time in my life working on ethics, and in particular, ethics of emerging technologies. I was privileged to be the only person invited to the White House Bioethics Committee to talk about nano. And this is essentially what came out of that. If anybody is interested, I want to share the interfaces of nano, so there's so many different things that also that you have here at this wonderful university. So that's the story. It actually gets deeper. This is personal. It doesn't have to be the same way. Faith. Now, we are a faith-based institution. We are open to anybody, no matter what their faith is. We treat everybody with the same respect and dedication. But I'll tell you a secret. I'm a Catholic. I'm a believer. I go to church all the time. I pray continuously. My life is based around my faith. There was a time, I was 10 years, I was a professor at Berkeley, the People's Republic of Berkeley, you can imagine. <laughs> Speaking about faith is not particularly encouraged. Then I went to another great state institution, Ohio State, and then I was at the University of Texas, I was at the National Cancer Institute, federal. And there is this that I personally consider, it's okay if you disagree, but let's, let's talk and make friends. I consider this a, a, a gross misinterpretation of the division of church and state, that you cannot talk about your faith in a state institution or a, come on, come on guys. I am a hospital. You are trusting your life to me, the life of your loved ones. And you don't want to know what I believe? If I don't tell you what I believe, I'm lying to you. I, I just don't feel, I don't feel it's ethical. If you come through the door and I don't tell you, look, I'm a Catholic. I be a Christian organization. These are our values. We are lying to you. That's my personal belief. So I spend a ton of time on, nano, of, no, on, on science and faith. For those of you that are interested, well, I'll be giving next week. Be my guests if you want to come down. I'll be delighted. Uh, we are giving the Michael, the Archbishop Miller Lecture at St. Thomas. Uh, I've given a similar talk. It's called Five Prayers at the University of Chicago two weeks ago in different places in Europe and in different areas. This is a little bit of what I talk about. My favorite nanotechnologists, Simon of Cyrene, Clement the Eleventh, also known as Saint Clement, and my, my super favorite of mine is uh, Saint Bonaventure. So, if, if you are interested in that, you know that, that's that I'm certainly delighted. What we do is important. Why we do it is a heck of a lot more important. And, and I'm honored if you'll be interested in coming and having a look at that. So at the end, I told you a bunch of stories. That was a lot of fun. Thanks so much. I'm sorry I came in late and I spoke too long. These are the people that actually do the work. I just tell the story. These are the people that fund us for the work that we do. God bless them all. <laughs> and, uh, and with this, thank you very much. <laughs>